All right. Um, it is uh, 940 Pacific, so I guess we should get started. Um, can everyone hear me? Um, awesome. I guess we're good to go then. Um, welcome, everyone, to our panel on cryptography uh, from theory to practice in Hyperledger. Um, the goal of today is to be fairly interactive, to allow you to ask questions. We've put together a broad range of people from cryptographers to cryptographic engineers, basically lots of people who use and build cryptography in a wide variety of ways today. So we'd like you to, um, we'd like to give you the opportunity to ask questions, uh, see what people are up to, and, and really just interact uh, with some of the core cryptographers in Hyperledger. Um, so I will start by introducing people and letting them uh, speak briefly about what sort of cryptographic work they do in Hyperledger. Um, so I'll start with uh, Angelo DiCaro. So Angelo, um, as many of you may know, is one of the original architects of Fabric and is an integral contributor to its uh, cryptographic systems. Um, he has a PhD from the University of Salerno. Um, and he's also an accomplished cryptographic researcher uh, with quite a number of publications across cryptography and security. Um, so Angelo, would you like to say a few words about what your cryptographic interests in Hyperledger are? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Hart for the introduction. Definitely today I will focus mostly on, on zero knowledge. And in particular, I would like to, uh, to discuss, to talk uh, about this new project in the fabric space uh, to bring tokens with zero knowledge uh, on top of Fabric. So very, very exciting news coming and I I'm looking forward to talk about uh, the, these things. Wonderful. Um, thanks a lot. So next, I'd like to introduce uh, Marta Pajkarska. Um, Marta is another accomplished academic. She has a PhD from the Technical University of Berlin. Um, she's a very accomplished security researcher uh, with a lot of publications in the area. Marta has a long and very interesting uh, history working in blockchain, uh, which I'm sure she can tell you about, from uh, Blockstream to a long time in Hyperledger, uh, and now working in DeFi uh, at Balancer Labs. So Marta, would you uh, care to say uh, what kind of crypto stuff you're interested in and working on? Sure. Um, so I guess um, given my background and the stuff that I'm doing now and kind of combining the two, uh, I'm really interested in how we can make DeFi more usable and secure. And what are the differences between um, the usability of, especially usability of permission blockchain systems and permissionless? So how does that impact usage? Uh, and is, are there things that we can learn from um, the permissionless world into Hyperledger or the other way around? Awesome. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, so next I will introduce Mike Lauder. For those of you that don't know him, uh, Mike is our most prolific uh, Ursa contributor and maintainer. He's done a lot of work across many hyper-religious projects, uh, including Indy and Aries. Uh, and he's a very, very prolific uh, freelance contributor. Um, you, If you have used uh, a lot of blockchain technology, there's a very good chance you have used some of his code. Um, so Mike, would you like to introduce yourself and say what you're interested in and working on? Mike, you're still muted. Mike, are you there? He said in the chat he's trying to get his audio to work. Okay. Well, then I guess it, we'll, we'll skip to you then, Brent. Uh, so finally, I'd like to introduce uh, Brent Zundel. Brent is the principal crypto engineer at Emerdim. He's been a longtime prolific Hyperledger contributor. He's worked on and been a maintainer on Ursa, Indy, and Aries. Um, and perhaps uh, most famously, he has a 
Best Real World Crypto Talk Award, which is something many famous people in academia uh, covet heavily. Um, so Brent, would you like to say a few words about what you're interested in crypto and what you're working on? Yeah, I, I'm i most interested uh, currently in uh, cryptography that allows for safe and non-correlating use of verifiable credentials, um, such as the India non-cred system and uh, more recently the BBS plus signatures that were introduced to URSA. Uh, today I'm going to talk mostly about the different uses that BBS plus is being put to in the real world um, and how it's being incorporated into different standards efforts kind of around the digital identity community. Fantastic. Um, and finally, um, I'm Hart. I am also a, uh, a cryptographer. And uh, one of my big interests is uh, post-quantum crypto. So I know there have historically been a lot of questions on post-quantum cryptography, uh, and I'll be happy to answer any of those today uh, if people are interested. So our goal for the panel is to have uh, it's, it's to give all of the audience, so all of you guys, uh, the opportunity to ask all of these uh, these expert cryptographers like Angelo, Mike, uh, Brent, and Marta, um, all the questions you want. Uh, so we are hoping to do that with uh, breakout rooms. So um, I guess, uh, Gary, is there a way we can start uh, having people go to breakout rooms? Hey, so uh, I believe that you were supposed to have links to those. Were those provided? So the the individual people with uh, breakout room, the, the, sorry, Angelo, Brent, Mike, and Marta, I believe got links. Uh, how can we have others join? Do we need to post those links in chat or? I think that's probably the best way. I can't think of a better way. So I, I would say, go ahead and do that. Say, you know, if you'd like to join my room, please click this link and then each individual can post that and then the person will be able to join it. Uh, okay, do if we, do you guys still have those links or alternatively we can answer I, questions? I do have some of them or you could, yeah, may, maybe start off as a combined okay. room and see how it goes. Yeah, why don't we start by answering questions uh, in chat. So does anyone have any questions about any of these topics that you'd like any of our panelists to answer? Um, please feel free to start uh, asking in chat. Um, otherwise, Angelo, I'd like to start by asking you a question. Um, so you were talking about some zero knowledge enhancements for fabric. Can you elaborate on these? Yes. So th there's been a long, a long request, a lot, so the, the long time since people have started requesting uh, uh, support for UTXO tokens uh, uh, for Fabric. And uh, in the in the background, the IBM, we we have worked on this, and we wanted to provide a solution that was um, very simple to use. That uh, I think I, I very much related with what Marta said. Um, cryptography, it's. Uh, but can be very complex uh, uh, to, to be used, um, not only from the, uh, from, from the end user perspective, but even for the developers who have then to put these building blocks together and make them and, and develop a distributed, uh, uh, distributed application. So what we open sourced, uh, um, it's called actually Fabric Token SDK. Uh, it's a piece of software that allows developers to develop uh, distributed applications in Fabric using uh, four tokens for utxo tokens the beauty of this, uh, this this sdk is essentially you can at any time decide to uh, use zero knowledge or not use zero knowledge in a absolutely transparent transparent way so not the developer not even the, the end user had to feel any birth feel any burden in using this uh, this zero knowledge the zero knowledge technology in practice what does it mean that uh, this framework takes care of the key handling, generating the proof, 
make sure that the, the metadata are distributed to all the parties. There are things, I, I think, one of the most complex parts was exactly distributing the, the private information to all the parties that needs to be aware of the, the information. Why is this? When we talk about zero knowledge, we are essentially talking about publishing commitments to the blockchain. Uh, because we don't want to reveal the content of the tokens, right? So we just use this uh, the digital commitments, which is an equivalent of the uh, an, uh, a sealed envelope, right? It's a digital version of the sealed envelope. And zero knowledge just allow us to prove statements on top of this on on the content of this uh, uh, of these commitments. But if uh, if Alice and Bob are swapping, for example, assets, uh, they must have a way to communicate to communicate to each other the secrets that they are using uh, in, to perform the to, to perform the operations so orchestrating this was actually more complex uh, than implementing the zero knowledge proof system uh, proof system itself so i can maybe give you the link in in, uh, in chat so you can start explore this project and if you have any question i'm very very glad to uh, to answer them, and in particular, we won this project. So we start, we open source, we we started open sourcing the first batch of the code, which is just give a um, a very sim simple experience with uh, with zero knowledge, and then with uh, in the coming days we put more and more technology uh, te technology out. Thanks a lot, Angelo. Please post that chat. I'm sure a lot of people yeah. will be interested. Um, so we have a couple of questions. Um, Mike, I'm going to pause on your question. Uh, HyperZ asks, is Hyperledger Fabric framework Turing complete? Uh, yes, the smart contract framework is Turing complete. Um, there's a question from uh, Pratam, which I think, Brent, maybe you can answer um, or Mike can answer. Um, the question is the following. Could you guys talk a bit about domain and domain proofs in BBS Plus Signature and share any kind of references or codes for domain proofs? Um, I'm happy to turn it over to Mike if his audio is working. Otherwise, I can try to muddle through. I believe he's still having audio problems. I'm trying to direct message him and work on that. But for now, I think uh, he, he's not able to connect. Uh, yeah, there's another question on BBS Plus in chat, Brent. So um, if you want to talk a little bit about that, that would be fantastic. I. I'm having trouble seeing the questions. Uh, so if the you Q &A. click, it's in the Q&A tab. Yeah, so you have to go session and then Q&A. Session, see, this is where, OK, too many tabs. <laughs> or I can just read out the question for you. Would you like oh, that? No, I, I, I see. Um, what do you mean by domain proofs? Would be my would be my response question. Um, so uh, I could talk to the first one, introducing predicate proofs into the JSON LD ZKP BBS Plus scheme. Um, this is something that we've actually stood up um, a working group at the Decentralized Identity Foundation to begin working on this. Um, the I, you're you're hitting on the the key thing there, Dan. The right now the decomposition into n quads as part of the canonicalization algorithm um, limits us from being able to structure the um, the inputs in such a way that is conducive to doing predicate proofs on them. Um, and so one thing that we're looking at is in is first adjusting the canonicalization algorithm to not use RDF canonicalization so that we can um, it can be more cleanly specified exactly how the inputs are being formatted and the second is to um, the first way we're looking at doing it is actually incorporating some of the ideas from Microsoft's um, Spartan uh, proposal and uh, work on that as kind of just taking off. I'm happy to drop links to uh, the sorts of things we're doing there. Awesome. Thanks a lot. I guess we can go back to that uh, if there are uh, more questions on that. Um, in the meantime, uh, Marta, I had a question for you. So 
what do you think the role of I, i'll call it uh i'll be nebulous and call it advanced cryptography uh, or advanced cryptographic protocols uh, are in DeFi, um, and how do you think that will drive cryptographic development well you know i guess it's interesting because DeFi gives a lot of great incentives to, for people to actually think about cryptography um because it's money and nobody wants to lose money so um i think that it is it's something that is top of mind for everyone um and like not only in terms of just traditional crypto but uh, just uh, analysis of the code and security like audits and things like that um balancer actually for their v2 uh, uh, version 2 launched uh, a bounty program that initially was one million and then uh, increased to two million dollars which i don't think i've ever ever heard about that big of a bounty and that tells you something about how serious the security is um or, or thinking about security so uh definitely there is a lot of scope for research in terms of understanding how can we prevent um uh yeah stuff around smart contracts how do we prevent uh smart contracts that are broken uh from executing how do we uh analyze something that's very interesting actually is um discussion around uh ultimately all of those DeFi protocols want to become uh, DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations so one of the models is that the governance or the community can propose uh, new changes or that are immediately encoded into smart contracts. That's the compound uh, style, which is uh, they just, if you want to have a proposal, you write the smart contract for it and then you propose it. Now, there is a lot of, a lot of mechanism in, in place in order to uh, kind of have a cool down, cool off period of, I think, two weeks before it actually gets. Uh, uh, but then once it gets executed, in this, in, it's just like two, two weeks that you can actually analyze this stuff and then it's there, it's out there. And then there are methods of preventing if, or like putting a hold on the system if there is uh, if there is a bug or, or some issue. But there is not much thinking going on into how do we streamline that. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I'm, I mean, always interested to see you know, sort of, uh, you know, how the the big money drives crypto and, and the bounties are, are super exciting for that because it, you know, it puts real money yeah. uh, I, behind. I have a question for you. Uh, sure. <laughs> so you mentioned, you know, that you want to talk about or you're interested in the post quantum crypto uh, and, and quantum crypto. I guess my constant question there is how big of a threat is it like, is, yeah that's is, a yes that's a great question and i think paul watkins asked a similar question um so truly figuring out what sort of threat uh quantum computers have is really for a, a question for physicists um, so i'm not a physicist uh, and I can't tell you exactly, you know, when this quantum computer will be ready, when we'll be able to crack, you know, RSA with quantum computers uh, and so forth. Um, there are a number of issues. And the biggest issue I see uh, is what's called forward secrecy. So basically what this means, right, is in today's world, right, we, we encrypt data with key exchange, right? You know, uh, we, we send data over the internet um, and there are lots of people recording all of this data, right? Um, so if someone records my data now and then five years later, someone else comes up with the quantum computer, right? Then all my old encrypted data might be able to be decrypted, right? So the idea is just if you're using some kind of encryption scheme today, and someone is saving your data, it could be broken in the future with quantum computing. So if you think, and I, I think this is probably, you know, way too optimistic, but if you think that a quantum computer will be able to break crypto in five years, 
you know, any data you have now that might still be sensitive in five years, you need to start thinking about uh, using a post quantum encryption scheme or a key exchange protocol. Um, so sort of the forward secrecy threat uh, is the biggest one. Um, and certainly for government and military applications, probably the most likely people to be able to get their hands on a quantum computer are going to be state level actors. So, you know, governments, uh, people like that. Uh, so, so that is a big thing. Um, fundamentally, we're going to, for blockchain at least, we're going to need to change our, uh, our signature algorithms. And there's a big uh, NIST competition on this. Um, so we'll probably end up using what's called lattice-based cryptography for new digital sing signature algorithms. Fundamentally, there's not much uh, change in terms of what an end user would see, although the key sizes are substantially larger. So you'd see some performance degradation. Um, so I hope that answered your, the questions. Um, we've got a lot of other questions that we'd like to answer. Um, so uh, Angelo, uh, you were asked, can you illustrate a use case for UTXO in combination with ZKP? Yeah, definitely. I replied also that uh, that's interesting. The first one that uh, uh, comes to my mind is definitely uh, central bank digital currencies. Um, there are a lot of initiatives uh, from many central banks in, in, in the world to digitalize uh, fiat currency. Definitely their privacy, um, not, not just not only privacy, uh, but also privacy with auditability. Um, so they the, the systems are, um, especially if you are talking about central banks, you will have uh, by uh, by law, by the law, you, parties that are entitled to be to be able to look at the uh, at these transactions. So some special parties in the system. Um, so just if if, you, if we just deploy zero knowledge as it is, uh, this will forbid this kind of auditability uh, auditability settings. So uh, th that is probably the the most crucial point because it becomes also the weakest point in the chain, right? So if there is a master key that can start uh, uh, kind of decrypting, even though we are not post in the, in the solution that uh, if you use our token SDK to implement CDBC, we actually, we are not posting uh, any ciphertext on the ledger because there, there are other regulations that would forbid anyway you to, po to post uh, ciphertext on the ledger. So there is there are other ways from which you can extract the content of the, um, of the commitment, but anyway, uh, this auditability is definitely uh, the the most interesting aspect in the enterprise application in the CDBC. Definitely, every time that you want start uh, tokenization of any assets, digital assets or um, real world assets that you want to move to the digital space, and you want to have multiple parties playing with these assets, you immediately you immediately face the need uh, to some to some level of privacy. And then with it, it will come immediately also some level of reconstruction. So you want to, you might want to see the history of certain assets that you have tokenized, or you might want to do uh, auditability. Um, so that's uh, more or less the, the set. It's pretty huge, yeah, it's pretty huge. Thank you. Um, Brent, so there was another question from Will Abramson on using CL or BBS plus based credentials as group SIGs. Um, Mike, had a very brief comment on that. Would you like to elaborate on it since Mike's audio is still not up? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a natural question to ask because the original reasons BBS and CL signatures were, I mean, they are group signature schemes. Uh, so why don't we use them as group signature schemes for credentials is, is a really good question. Um, the, the only answer I really have, we've talked about it some, talked about that it is a capability that we could introduce. But what has kind of failed to emerge in the conversations is, is a really key use case to drive it. So it's not that it can't be done, it's that nobody has come along and said, here's my use case, I really, really need group signature functionality in order to enable it. Gotcha, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, but pairings-based signatures, you can typically uh, get this extra functionality without a lot of extra effort. 
Um, it's just a matter of people needing it. So I guess we have a, uh, a minefield question that I will defer to the Europeans on the panel. Um, so what is the best way to implement business rules in chain codes that need to support the GDPR model? Um, Marta or Angela, would you like to tackle this question? Marta, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just replied actually with the with the paper. So. It would be easier if the box that says "turn your mic on" didn't cover mic on icon. Um, <laughs> so I was saying for I. I think Angela, you're the best person to answer that, and I would actually love to hear your summary uh, of that because uh, it is definitely something that is coming up uh, a lot uh, in in permission blockchain space, especially. Yeah, yeah. Um, so definitely, what I can say that I can point. I, I posted a link uh, in reply to uh, to a paper written by accepted the conference, so a peer reviewed paper. Uh, written by colleagues of mine from Haifa, um, and they 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 go in uh, in uh, lots of details about uh, this right to be forgotten, which is uh, what it's, uh, it's in a sense GDPR is also um, is giving to uh, to to any person or re is recognizing uh, as a right for uh, to, to any person. So I would I just refer to that paper. There it's a lot, there are, there are a lot many details uh, uh, written there. There was also a proposal to bring this uh, um, uh, to Fabric, actually, to simplify the life of developer. If uh, if I, um, I if I understand the question, it's uh, the, it, it's more from a technical. So how do we write this in practice? Unfortunately, that that's another topic where we really would like to have the community helping us in delivering this uh, uh, this GDPR support for Fabric. It would be really fantastic. Otherwise, you know, it's like saying that we are uh, implementing the same solution again and again and again and again, which is essentially based on uh, at the current stage with the private data collection. So you are posting only hashes on the ledger that are not uh, uh, brute forceable. So given the hash, uh, if you don't know anything else, you cannot really, you don't really know what's behind. In a, in a sense, you can consider the hash as a commitment, a hiding commitment in this, uh, um, in this sense. This is the, alone is not enough because even now, the, now the private information are stored somewhere, and even in this somewhere, you have to give a possibility to erase this information. Keep in mind that yeah. there is no way, or definitely not a cryptographic way. And I, don't, I think this is, will be a physical problem. Uh, how can I prove that I really deleted the something? And indeed, I think GDPR is it's only saying that certain pieces of certain pieces of information are not accessible anymore. So that's the one of, one of the other goals. So I'd like to take this from from the indie perspective. We've uh, struggled with this a little bit as well. The the first thing that indie did and Sovereign in particular, which is a uh, you know a uh, uses Indy is um, they avoid putting people's information on the chain in the first place. You know, that's like number one rule. If it's not there, there's no need to have anybody ask to get rid of it. Um, and then the second, the, the mechanism that they were looking at introducing, should it become necessary to do so was actually um, because the in Indy is a, is a permissioned network. Um, it's possible for the nodes, if the node validators, um, it's possible for the node validators to, to be able to say, oh, I, ha I, I no longer have that information. It's on the chain, but it's not retrievable anymore in any sort of secure or verifiable way. Um, and so that's, that's kind of a, a similar approach to what uh, Dr. Dakar was saying. Different chain. I, uh, it's, it is quite interesting, uh, this, this whole right to revoke or right to delete data. Um, I've always been of the opinion that at least uh, the fact that you can record and prove that you requested data in a reliable way is better than uh, the system without blockchain where you can just claim it, but it's claim against claim. Um, I'm wondering, do you know, because I actually don't, 
Um, how does the forward secrecy that Hart was talking about, how does that impact GDPR? If we say, well, today the data is secure, but because uh, it's encrypted and hashed and everything, but for, uh, in five years time, all of those, and become it's it is not private anymore. Um, is that something that uh, the regulation takes into account? I would say that it's a killer. If you if you start posting ciphertext on the ledger, that will kill you. That's that's for sure. Because the ciphertext, no matter what, even uh, even if you get forward uh, forward security, um, I mean the past will be lost. So that's uh, that, that, that's a problem. So you should you should not put ciphertext on the ledger if you want this kind of right. Indeed, there is also another problem. Uh, I think this, uh, I heard this uh, in the, the first time I was dealing with the banking world. Uh, they, a, a bank, so there, there are certain legal parties that uh, if they are storing ciphertext, they are, uh, um, they are responsible to be able to decrypt them. So they must know the secret key to decrypt those ciphertext. But if now anyone is starting pushing ciphertext on the ledger, I mean, how can, I, how can I have? I don't have all these keys to the secret keys to the uh, to, to the crypto. So that's a no no. Ciphertext on the ledger it's just a no for many uh, for many reasons. Hey, once the ciphertexts are out, then of course th this is a different uh, uh, it's it's a different story. And the, usually the so if a hacker is able to penetrate your system, uh, then of course the, the the past is lost. What you could do actually, it's uh, instead of storing the ciphertext in a single place you might start secret sharing the ciphertext. So, you know, you put pieces, it's like breaking the ciphertext in multiple pieces. And here you, you start spreading the ciphertext um, in, in, in multiple places. So in such a way, an attacker, even if he breaks a, a few servers, he will not be able to reconstruct, uh, uh, not even the ciphertext. Yeah, to go technical, basically, to, to adhere to sort of all these privacy rules, um, you can view sort of hashes and other things as to as commitments to things, right? So like if I put a hash on a blockchain, it's sort of a commitment to the blockchain. Um, and commitments, well, in the ideal world, they're either computationally hiding and statistically binding or statistically hiding and computationally binding. Now I'm not sure how that how much sense that makes to non cryptographers, but basically, what that means is if I have like a message or something and then I pad it with a bunch of random stuff and then I hash it, well, I can view that hash value as sort of a proof of the original message due to the collision resistance of the original hash function. Um, but if someone breaks the hash function, then they, you know, they can't come up with my message because it, there are just too many possible messages. It's information theoretically hiding. Um, so, so there are, I think there are ways around this, but as Angela points out, you can't store ciphertext on the blockchain uh, if you're worried about forward secrecy and privacy laws. Um, so speaking of Angelo, there are some zero knowledge questions for you. Um, is there any advantage to use interactive ZKPs over NISX and consortium blockchains? And what about setting up the trust infrastructure between parties? Brent, you can also jump in here if you want. Yeah, yeah very interesting. I would say it, it very depends on the blockchain uh, system. So as I replied, in general, it's a no in the sense that the verification, if you take Ethereum, the verification cannot happen interactively because that's, uh, it, it's like saying that the, the entire network should connect to the prover and uh, interact to do in order to verify if a zero knowledge proof is correct or not so in blockchains like ethereum that use the paradigm order uh, and then execute um, you can only use NISX, so non-interactive zero knowledge uh, proof but in fabric actually we we use a, a complete different paradigm we, we instead say you first execute then you uh you order and then you validate so during the, the execution phase, you can say, OK, now there, there are a bunch of, of, of servers that uh, what we call endorsers that will verify the zero knowledge proof, possibly even in an interactive way. And then the rest of the network will trust these, uh, these, uh, these endorsers uh, via the endorsement policy um, uh, in having done this, uh, this thing. So in, a, in Fabric, even, uh, uh, even interactive zero knowledge proofs are possible if this brings 
uh, some advantage, but uh, it, it remains to be seen. Non-interactive zero knowledge proof, especially when it's if it's a, it's a snark, it's a, a succinct, it's very efficient to verify. So the burden of interaction, why, why we should take setup? Setup is, that, uh, is, is also another very dramatic thing. Luckily, there are now um, non-interactive zero knowledge proof systems that do not require a trusted setup. You just have to pick a hash function and then you go uh, and then you go with it. So, so this, uh, these are very good. And even some that are updatable. So once you publish uh, the public parameters, this can be updated continuously. So a lot of progress on this. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that this is a, an issue as a, as it was a few years ago. Thanks. Um, so Brent, we have a question about threshold signatures. Would you like to uh, answer this? Um, I, I could repeat your answer shortly. Yes, we're working on this. Um, or by we, I mean Mike Water is working on this. Um, it's definitely something that we see as being valuable. You know, there are, there are use cases that are asking for it and requiring, you know, require that require threshold signatures. So what we are looking to build in URSA is a capability to essentially thresholdize any of the signature schemes that we already have. Um, so, yeah, short answer, yes. Longer answer, come to the URSA meetings and talk to us about it. We'd love to have input. That's a good point. Uh, URSA meetings are open to everyone. You can just show up. Uh, you don't eat, have to speak. Uh, you can just lurk if you want. Uh, so feel free to join. Um, Angelo, do you want to address the question on the difference between the uh, fabric tokens? Yeah, yeah, I was just replying. That that one, uh, the, the sample, the sample was published there. It was just... Uh, uh, really, a, a specific uh, a specific example uh, how you could implement uh, uh, tokens there. The token SDK that we are now proposing is agnostic. Is actually um, has this beautiful uh, two layer API that uh, gives to the developer an abstraction that is agnostic to the in, the actual implementation of the token on top of Fabric. What does it mean? This in practice that you can switch the technology that you use behind. So either zero knowledge or uh, Actually, when I say zero knowledge, uh, there are many, many zero knowledge proof systems that can be used. So you can change the zero knowledge proof system that uh, that you use, or you can even just use a plain version of the tokens if you don't need the, uh, you don't need any privacy. Or in certain settings, you might need to have auditing. In others, you don't need to have auditing. So the token SDK brings all this knowledge in a single place in a systemized, uh, systemized, uh, systemized way. For the developers to quickly develop develop token applications for um, for fabric, so that that I would be I would say that it's the and of, of, and um, also the interesting thing is that the the technology that we are deploying we are open sourcing for the zero knowledge part is also uh, it's in a paper that uh, is peer reviewed anyone can look I posted also the link here um, uh, the, just as a start that's the technology that we are gonna open source. Uh, thanks a lot. So um, I'm assuming VCs is verifiable credentials here and not verifiable computation. Uh, but uh, Dan Yamamoto asks, is there any work of provable security of VCs? Can we just apply anonymous credential models, uh, game-based or UC-based to evaluate it? Brent, would you like to take this question? Uh, yeah, I can try. So there... Um, for VCs in particular, I don't know of any provable security work happening right now. Um, for the most part, I believe you can just apply the anonymous credential models uh, for those signatures that are applicable to those models. Uh, one of the things about a verifiable credential is um, some of them use BBS plus, some of them use CL signatures, some of them use E25519 signatures and, and aren't selectively disclosable or zero knowledge proof capable signatures at all. Um, and so the, yeah, for the most part, there's, there are, you know, the anonymous credential models, I believe apply. Um, something that would be worth examining is the impact that introducing JSON LD aspects into the data model itself would have might affect, um, the provable security there so it's it's an open question it's something we're interested in exploring and and folks need to look at so i think that uh 
the UC model is a great model to look at blockchain in if you're familiar with what it is. Um, just because, well, we need, you know, blockchains are never used in a vacuum. We need to compose constantly different cryptographic protocols. Uh, so it, it's very useful. The only issue is that UC proofs are like catastrophically long and complicated. Uh, if you look at any of these UC for blockchain papers, uh, they are literally hundreds of pages long and full of incredibly complicated proofs. Uh, so that's probably why we haven't seen any, to my knowledge, uh, UC for verifiable credentials yet. Um, just, it, yeah, I can only imagine the paper length. Um, so uh, I guess we have another question. Uh, Arnab asks, any thoughts on bringing SMPTC techniques using Fabric private data. Do you want to answer that, Angelo? Yeah, I just posted another uh, uh, a link to a paper that we published uh, uh, a few 2000, I think 2019 or 2018, uh, where we show um, uh, that it's actually an application to the finance, to the, the financial world. Is uh, uh, the, the initial public offering. Uh, so how do we run the initial public offering uh, from with full security, with full privacy, privacy with respect to the orders of the bidders, of the investors, uh, that, for example, they, they might not want to trust uh, um, an investment bank uh, to collect the orders and then to decide the price of the new, or the, the, the price of the new stocks. Um, so definitely, yes, and uh, there is no need for far, uh, fabric private, uh, private data, actually. What is interesting is that at that time we didn't have yet uh, um, another piece of software that we are open. So we have already open source a few days ago. We just open source that we called uh, Fabric Smart Client, that will give you the ability to implement these kind of things uh, very easily on uh, on top of Fabric. And thanks for posting the link. I, I mean, I think everyone appreciates the posting of the papers and links. Uh, for all of the relevant questions that are being asked. Um, so I guess I think we've answered all of the questions in chat at this point. So it, I mean, please, everyone, feel free to uh, to ask. Um, I, I see one. Did we answer the NP complete problems? Uh, no, uh, I, I don't think we did. I replied to that one. But I Angela replied. replied. The ZKP. Uh, actually, I wouldn't, you know, we don't. It's not like anymore. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go that that way that far. I mean, you don't need to. Uh, you don't need to to look at the NP complete pro the problem. So you look at that. Uh, I mean, it, it's just a complication that you, you, you just don't need. We don't need to go into this uh, this kind of data. So it just to know. It's just enough to know that the, there are general purpose zero knowledge proof systems uh, that can prove that generate zero knowledge proof for essentially any statement. Uh, then the, the, how they do that, it's very technical. Uh, it, does, um, it doesn't really matter. What matters actually, maybe uh, that's also, uh, I guess it's important also for the, 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 the different industries that might want to use zero knowledge technology and in particular the finance. Uh, the finance space is to come out with a standardization of zero knowledge proof. So the guys in ZK proof, uh, uh, the, the guys from the ZK proof standard, they are definitely doing a great work to push in having a, a standardization of the, the primitives of the assumption, the cryptographic assumptions, uh, how this, uh, how zero, the proofs are encoded, uh, which, how do we encode the statements that we are, um, uh, that we are proving? That's definitely something that is very interesting and also there's also another aspect that uh, uh, I think it's not a minor, but uh, um, we must have a way, you know, in most, for example, if we talk about the UTXO token, um, and let's suppose that Alice wants to spend a token, um, most of the time in an enterprise space, the secret key that Alice might use to spend this token will be in an HSM. So we must have also zero knowledge proofs or statements that are friendly with the with the HSM, therefore, you know, again, HSM is hardware. They are not. Uh, they, it's very difficult to deploy new cryptographic uh, signature schemes on on HSM. Uh, so we better be uh, compatible with existing uh, signature scheme like ADDSA. That that's really actually a very good scheme. 
very secure, very, very, uh, very powerful, very compatible also with HSM and with the, the most advanced zero knowledge proof system that we are aware of. So combining these two, two elements, uh, you get compatibility with HSM, uh, full power at the zero knowledge space. It's very, uh, it's a win-win, I would say. Can I ask one more question? Um, so I was wondering, what do you think about the um, kind of development of building HSMs in the cloud or whatever you want to call them, but moving from the hardware part of HSMs um, in, in order to kind of catch up with, with the cloud developments? Oh, hey, maybe my colleagues, uh, my colleagues in Zurich are better experts than, uh, than me or all the possible uh, um uh scenarios i don't really know what's uh, uh what's the security what's the threat model uh, uh there i think they have i think they, there is a threat model where essentially even someone who has root access to the machine cannot access uh, the uh, the hsm so they are kind in an isolated environment so now it's all about trust, right? So you, you buy, you are buying this service from a cloud provider. You are trusting that they are not cheating or they are really delivering on, on what, uh, on, 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 on this, uh, on, the, on this premises. Anyway, no matter what, you know, if you don't trust a single provider, you can always uh, spread your secret keys. There are, I think there, there are in, uh, in the, the HSM space protocols to have keys dispersed in multiple HSMs and then they come together, they, they, they speak to each other and then they generate a signature. But again, it's, a, it's always a trade-off between security uh, and performance because then to generate a signature, I mean, you know, if you start have to inter if you have to interact to generate a signature, it will take more time. So again, it's a matter of compromises, I would say. So Mike, we have you back. Um, Can you actually hear me, though? Yeah, it's great. Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> um, we have some questions for you. Uh, so do you want to talk about the work being done on Ursa in Ursa on threshold signatures? Yeah, so I'm working on implementing like all the threshold, the major signature types, like for the Bitcoin curve, um, ED2519 and BLS. So with you know, both a distributed key gen and distributed signing. Um, and that's mostly for the clients I work for. That's what they're interested in. And I know um, that this is a major interest of blockchains, right? And so uh, we've looked at different HSMs. The best one that I've seen that I'd like to use, since you were on that topic, Angelo, uh, is, is the Amazon's new Nitro Enclaves. It's similar to like Intel SGX, but a heck of a lot simpler to write code for. Okay. Um, so that's what we're using. Um, there's there's no network, there's no persistence, and the memory gets wiped every time the thing starts and stops. So, which is really nice, but that also means we have that problem of we can't persist the keys, right? So we have to inject them. And so we're doing all sorts of techniques with Shamir secret sharing to, nice. you know, talk directly to the enclave, inject it over SSL, and then the keys are set. And, but then, but then we're trying to do distributed key gen that signing versus doing these HSMs like cloud HSMs or Azure's, uh, was it uh, secret computing or I can't remember the exact name, but you, you get the point. There's all these cloud HSMs and um, take your pick, right? So Azure's is based on Intel SGX. Amazon's is their own proprietary thing, but it's pretty simple to use. And then they've also got cloud HSMs and then Google's got their secure compute. So, I mean, it's all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. yeah interesting. Yeah. Indeed. Right. Um, does, if anyone else has, uh, any more questions, um, please feel free to ask, um, uh, running up on our time. We only have about 10 more minutes left. Um, I would like to emphasize that everyone uh, on this panel is relatively publicly available and you can ask us more crypto questions or whatever questions you want. Um, maybe you're interested in Brent's basement. Um, <laughs> but you can ask whatever questions you want on the 
uh, on the public uh, forums. Um, so yes, please, uh, you know, don't be shy in the future, even if you didn't ask your questions today. Um, so I guess I'd like to close with sort of some uh, some forward looking questions. Um, what do you all on this panel uh, think we need to do going forward uh, for sort of both cryptographic functionalities on blockchain and uh, general cryptographic and security safety on blockchain? What should we be looking to do uh, in the world of cryptography? Anyone can take this. I can start. <laughs> I'll, I'll start on the soft side. Uh, I think that uh, we are still lagging in thinking around uh, blockchain. When you build out a blockchain consortium or a consortium in blockchain, how do you um, figure out the um, interactions between participants and how do you ensure that people feel comfortable and understand what it means to using uh, blockchain? Um, also, in permission space, there is not much thinking about the on-chain governance versus off-chain governance. That usually falls like usually everyone falls under the off-chain governance, and then it's not really a blockchain. Um, so I think these are the things uh, in permission space that that need kind of analyzing and looking into. Um, in general, I think that we are really still very much behind usability. There is too much that people need to understand in order to uh, build those systems and to even to use them. And I'm seeing that actually there's more even in DeFi than, uh, than in permission space. Um, unfortunately, people are losing a lot of money because they don't really understand. I, I like to say that we, try to say that we democratized finance space by but it's like giving people knives and not telling them to point them outwards so they are just mostly end up stabbing themselves awesome yeah that that makes a lot of sense um, does anyone else have any any more comments but look, from my point of view, uh, I like a lot competition. I think we have to to uh, to foster competition in the in this space. Blockchain, first of all, is giving us a, a huge opportunity to deploy this uh, some crypto technology that was considered very fancy, very fancy. Even though, let me say, even cr tr tr threshold crypto, I think it has more than forty years. So it, it's a very well established, at least in the in the, the academia in the acad uh, academia. It's very well established technique, though there is a point, and I totally agree with Mark on this. Even threshold is not so usable in uh, uh, in practice. It's not so obvious to deploy, and the same thing is for uh, for zero knowledge. Well understood, primitive from a theoretical point of view, you always forget that there are the small details. Uh, that actually, when you go and deploy, you start asking yourself, "Ah, oh, but where is this? Where is this? How do I how do I deploy this? Ah, oh, but this becomes now the weakest point in, uh, in in my chain of security. What do I do here?" So you see, there are very problems. So we have to foster this competition. I hope that Hyperledger will push stronger and stronger on 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 on, on this tool to set the bar very high on the projects that are are, are coming in to ask the projects, "Hey." come with real solution that people can really use and can make a difference. The biggest problem with threshold is um, is not necessarily deployability, but uh, but practicality. You know, yeah, it's great to do five out of 15, but how many, when it actually comes down to it, are you actually going to wait for five people <laughs> to sit there and participate? No, everybody wants their things now. So what is everybody doing? Two of two, for yeah, example, yeah. right? No one wants to go higher than that because it's it takes too long, or and they want their their stuff now. So I agree. With you. Yeah, practicality is a, a big issue. There's a tendency in the uh, in the cryptographic community and academia, anyway, to say something is practical. Uh, if it can run on a computer the size of the galaxy. Um, <laughs> but uh, 
that that's pretty far from the truth. Um, you know, one of the things I'm excited about is the, the potential for sort of one-off multi-party computations uh, to be used in a lot of, of blockchain applications. There are a lot of things you only need to do once, and maybe you don't care if they're super efficient. Um, so, so that's sort of something uh, I think will become popular in the future. Um, so I guess with only a couple of minutes left, uh, does anyone have any final words or, or how to get in touch with you or how to answer more questions or, or any sort of tips like that uh, for the audience? Uh, panelists, uh, anything? Well, we should definitely point folks to the URSA channel on Rocket Chat uh, if that hasn't been done. And I, our, I don't know if we're having a meeting this week, but in two weeks from today, at least, there will be an URSA meeting that folks should uh, feel free to come to, take your, bring your questions there. We, we love sitting around and talking about crypto stuff. That's pretty much why we keep going to the URSA meetings. Um, so, so you're welcome to join us there. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure anybody, what else should we say? There's a bunch of other uh, security talks uh, over the next uh, two days, two and a half be sure to check them out, including actually, I just checked the schedule and there is a GDPR and fabric talk. So, Have even that. Um, awesome. I posted the link to the uh, Earth chat channel. Um, everyone here should feel free to post and use that or the mailing list or come to the meetings. Um, where, as Brent said, we do like talking about, uh, you know, random problems in cryptography. Um, so even if, well, we're like anyone else, we like procrastinating real work to talk about fun crypto problems. So, um, well, all right. So yeah. Well, and yeah, thank great. you. Uh, thanks to all the panelists. Thanks for participating. Thanks to the audience for all of the questions. Uh, I hope you, uh, you know, learned at least a little something. And uh, yeah, please feel free to to follow up uh, with anyone. I mean, we're all I think publicly available on Rocket Chat. So if you even want to, you know, message us individually, that's totally fine. Um, so yes, uh, thank you all for your time. And, uh, if there are P if there are PhD students, uh, please apply to IBM. Come, we we have internship. <laughs> <laughs> nice, definitely. Yeah, yep. IBM Zurich is a, a great group. So, all right, all right. Bye. Well, thanks, Bye. thanks a lot, everybody, and uh, have a great rest of uh, your HGF. You too. Thanks, Hart. Thank you, Hal.